this, this is the last of our roundtables for this uh, year. Uh, and we are lucky to have with us a professional musician, composer, and educator uh, named Paul Combs. And um, he is the author of this marvelous book that I'm holding in my hand called Dameronia, The Life and Music of Pat Dameron. Uh, I think we're in for a nice evening. Um, he sort of let me in on some of what he's going to talk about, so I know what, what's going to happen. So uh, I'm going to sit back and just let Paul take over. So let's have a nice round of applause for Paul Combs. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here once again. I did a lot of the research for this book uh, at this happy place. And uh, actually going all the way back till the, we were across the street. But uh, so... Happy holidays. <laughs> yes, yes. Anyway, um, I think the first thing that I've got to get out of the way very quickly, people always ask me, why Tad? Why, Tad? Well, when I was a, a teenager, I became aware of Tad's music, especially his uh, uh, little big bands. And I really liked the sound of that. I read an interview or a comment on a liner note from Charles Mingus where he commented on Tad's ability to get a big sound out of a few instruments and so on. So now I was a big Mingus fan, still am. So uh, that you know, that added to Tad's importance. 1961, I'm 15 years old when he comes out of Lexington. And of course, there's uh, interviews in um, Downbeat and so on. He's back on the scene. And um, around the same time, my stepfather, who was in the book trade, gave me a book, a used book, of, uh, of the writings of Barry Ulanoff. And there was that interview that Ulanoff had done where Tad commented on there being enough ugliness in the world. He was about making beauty. And as a young musician, shaping up my own sense of purpose, uh, that really sat well with me. It still does. So that's why Tad. Oh, well, also, uh, early 80s, I wrote a composition uh, tune that uh, I really heard his influence on me in it. And I went to the library and was shocked there was no book on Tad Dameron. And one thing and another, went back to get my master's degree, learned how to do research, and I said, okay, I'll give it a try. I, uh, first interview was with, uh, with Charlie Rouse. We had a lovely afternoon talking with each other. And he got up, shake hands, he held on to my hand, looked me in the eye and said, promise me you're going to finish this book. Caught up with Dizzy, had some questions for him. You know, I mean, literally caught up with him. He was playing in a ballroom, so he, there wasn't any way out but to come out the front door. <laughs> and um, he did the same thing, held on in my hand, said, look me in the eye, said, promise me you're going to finish this book. I got to spend a couple hours with Art Blakey in his hotel room. Get up to leave, shake his hand. And I, and same thing. So we had to do it. I'm going to try to take you quickly as I can through his biography, um, just so you have a sense of his life. Um, I obviously go into it in more detail in the book as much as I could. He's a rather private guy, but uh, we dug up as much as we could. He was born in February, uh, February 21st, 1917. Um, and his mother, Ruth, and his father, Isaiah Peake. Uh, Ruth's maiden name is Harris, and that uh, plays an, that comes back to have a little bit of significance. His older brother had been born two years earlier, uh, Caesar, who's also a musician, stays in Cleveland, but has quite a career in Cleveland. Um, fortunately, by 1919, Isaiah Peake left his young family, and even more unfortunately, did not leave the neighborhood. And um, we don't know what impact that may have had on the boys. I have suspected it had some serious effects on Tad, but I don't know. So Ruth supported herself and her boys by uh, taking in seamstress work, and she also played piano in the silent movies, probably bringing the boys along with her on occasion if she couldn't get relatives to watch them. 
Uh, Tad certainly said he had interest in music from the age of four, and possibly earlier. We, it's hard to remember much earlier than four years old. Anyway, by seven years old, uh, by the time he was seven, um, Ruth had met a gentleman named Adolphus Dameron, who married her. And um, the boys took the Dameron name, and um, another, further evidence that the father didn't, uh, didn't have much to do with the, with the boys after he left the family is that he didn't put up any fuss about that. There's uh, Tad and Caesar. Um, dressed pretty well, so I imagine Adolphus, did, even though they hadn't gotten married quite yet at this point, uh, Adolphus is probably looking out for Ruth and her boys. And uh, the uh, family, the Dameron family and Ruth's family, the Harrises, were all amateur musicians and even some professionals. I said Harris was a significant name because her, her brother, Eddie, um, was a trumpet player as well as a machinist, so he was a kind of a, a weekend warrior. And his being a machinist helps Tad out at various times in his life, as we will see. We don't know too much about his musical education. He said he took lessons from his mother, but she definitely had him practice, because uh, um, one of his childhood friends recalls him her, recalls her coming out when they were playing baseball, and he wanted to play baseball rather than come in and practice. And she came out with the razor strap. So <laughs> you're getting back in here and practicing. So <laughs> he was about nine at that time. By the time he got into high school, his older brother and his older brother's friends are probably coaching him, teaching him about theory and so on, because he said he took the theory class in high school, but almost flunked because he knew all the stuff already and it bored him. By the time he was um, a senior in high school, uh, his brother was bringing him to jam sessions and Tad was uh, distinguishing himself. Uh, the older musicians, some of them were kind of aghast at what this, the voicings this young man was using at the piano. This is 1935. Uh, but others of a more progressive mindset were delighted, were really impressed, you know, whoa, this young guy is doing this. So um, although he said, I believe to Ulanov, that he went to Oberlin to study medicine, that wasn't the case at all. Oberlin has no record of him ever being there. And my suspicion is that he entered the world of professional music right out of high school. There were no doubt singers in, in small clubs to accompany. Um, there seems to be some indication that uh, he subbed at least with the bands of Zack White and, um, uh, and others around Cleveland. Um, by 1937, probably, his childhood friend Freddie Webster, the great trumpet player who died too young, which is why a lot of people may not know about Freddie Webster, but Freddie Webster was magnificent. And uh, they grew up, they were the same age. They were, you know, playmates. And, well, Freddie had put together a 13, 14 piece band. Tad was in that band, wrote arrangements for it, and um, uh, sang, played the piano, and so on. By 1938, Tad and Freddie are going off to Chicago occasionally. Freddie spent some time with the Heinz Band. Bud Johnson remembers the Heinz Band running down some of Tad's charts. Tad had already sold charts to the Jeter Pillars Orchestra, who were active in Cleveland at the time. That's before they set up shop in St. Louis. And probably others, maybe smaller bands around town and so on. And this will become of significance later on. Um, by 1939, he's working for Vito Musso, who has a big band at that time. He goes to New York with Musso. Um, big band business is a tough business. And Vito had you know, quite a reputation as a soloist. Harry James offers him a job. He's tired of trying to make payroll. He disbands in Brooklyn. And Tad is stuck in New York. He's at the, living at the the Woodside, and there he meets Harlan Leonard, who's getting a lot of good press and is 
making records on Blue Note, on Bluebird, excuse me. And um, so he goes off to Kansas City and um, not only writes some nice charts for Harlan Leonard, but he, uh, he also shows his skills as a rehearsal coach. And the band is noticeably tighter and better in tune when you hear the recordings made in the summer of 1940 as opposed to those made in January, previous to Tad's joining the band. Um, and, and Jesse Price is on record for having commented on that, how Tad rehearsed the band every day and so on. Being a rehearsal coach is going to play a big role in his life and how he makes his living. Um, so he writes his first arrangements, which stand up against arrangements by Eddie Durham and Roselle Claxon. They're, they're excellent arrangements. Um, it would appear he mentioned taking a year off uh, to do his, his uh, requirement for so selective service. This is before the war. Um, so he, he, it seems that a year of working in one of the aircraft plants probably in Cleveland, and again, that's where Uncle Eddie probably helped him get that job, uh, took care of that because we don't have any record of him from that summer of 1940 until 1941 in the fall when he goes to work for Jimmy Lunsford. Works for Lunsford for a year and a half, two years, uh, copying parts, writing charts, rehearsing the band, so on, gets tired of that and probably has established himself well enough to go freelance. Part of his freelancing is coaching uh, Count Basie's band. And during that time, during the recording band, he, uh, oh, I, I had a note here. I have to go back to Kansas City. I have to come back to Kansas City. Very important, Kansas City. In Kansas City, he and Charlie Parker become close friends, and he and Mary Lou Williams become close friends. Two very important friendships in his life begin in Kansas City in 1940. So now around 1943, he and Dizzy meet up at Minton's or Monroe's. Dizzy loves the way he plays the piano. They talk about, you know, how he's, he's the chords that he's playing and his accompaniment. And, um, and they become fast friends and remain so. 